begin a series entitled The Abundant Life. And um, you think of this phrase, we're going to see in just a moment, that Jesus gives to us and offers us. I think we as Christians, we, we get so bogged down in life that we forget the abundance that Christ offers. What a blessing, what a joy it is to see this phrase and hopefully it will bring some refreshment to your soul as we go through our series here in this. And uh, tonight we're going to kind of do an introduction. We're going to look at this verse in kind of a more detail and then the rest of the series is going to take more of a topical kind of study and I'll explain that later on. So. Let's take our Bibles and turn to John 10. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me as we read, beginning at verse number 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, let me clear it up for you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is in hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is in hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there, there shall be one fold, and one shepherd. And therefore, will not my, or doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. But I lay it down with myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And then, there was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sakes. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. And we're thankful, of course, for the Lord Jesus Christ, for who he is, and for what he came to do. God, I pray that you would help us as your sheep, God, to hear his voice, to understand the truth the message that he is conveying to us. I pray that the Spirit of God would have free course and liberty among us, and that you'll not only instruct us, but more to instill in us an understanding of the blessing, the joy of what it is to be a child of God. God, thank you for your word. Bless as we study it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May we see it. Life is a precious thing. When you start to evaluate life and all that it entails, all that it involves, we get excited. Right when uh, an announcement is made that somebody is going to have a child. Last week we had the privilege of announcing that Pastor 
Leah and Nick's are having their first child. And what a blessing that was. And everyone, I didn't see a, I, I saw a few people wondering with a little amazement about Pastor Nix, but for Leah, I mean, everyone was just joyful. This is great. She's going to be a wonderful mom, and Pastor Nix will be a great dad. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't realize that yet, but uh, he's going to be a great dad, and we're, we're, we're so excited. And when you, you talk about life, it, it, it brings joy. I mean, you sit here and you think, wow, this is amazing. I mean, life when you start thinking of all the elements and the intricacies of life and how that all comes about, it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling. It's amazing to think about it. And then all of a sudden you go through life and you're like, you know, it's not that much fun now that I'm experiencing it. Why? Because we go through what we would call roller coaster life cycles, right? We go through the ups and the downs, the ins and the outs, the highs and the lows, and we get to a place and we think, you know what? It's not all that it's cracked up to be. We heard this week of another shooting in one of our schools. Absolute tragedy. Why something like this happens in our, in our schools is unbelievable. And we stand in utter amazement. Maybe, perhaps, you're not just amazed over it, maybe you're angered over it. And perhaps maybe we would say rightfully so. Because life is precious. It is a precious commodity. On top of that, those of us who are in here right now have experienced life. But on top of that, we get to experience eternal life. Everlasting life. God offers to humanity the privilege and the joy of not only breathing the air of this life, but then enjoying Him forever. What an incredible thing it is. No matter what happens to me in this earthly life, I know that I have eternal life, and nothing can take that away. I love later on in this passage, perhaps the most powerful words that Jesus offers to us regarding the matter of an eternal security. He writes in verse number 28 in John 10 here, that I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. What, a, what an amazing <coughs> truth that is. And so, no matter what my earthly life looks like, my eternal life is secure, it's settled, and I am completely satisfied with that. Then why do we have depression? Why do we have discouragement? Why do we face despair and despondency? Why do people get so engulfed in life that Suicide seems to be their only way out. Why? Especially a child of God. How does this happen? Why does this happen? This evening I want to begin this series entitled The Abundant Life because can I say that is not what Jesus wants you to need to experience. Sure, we're going to have afflictions. He promises us that. We'll have tribulation. We'll have trouble. We'll have trials. We'll have tests. We'll have all of that. Do those things have to bring us to a point of despair and despondency and depression? And our life becomes this <coughs> cycle of, or this web of, I don't understand, I don't like it, I don't want it, I need out. And Jesus says, that's not what I have for you. Again here in verse number 10, which is our theme verse, Jesus said, I am come. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more. Abundantly. 
He's not only offered to us life, but he has offered us a life that is in abundance. What does that mean? Or maybe I should ask, what does this actually look like? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. The writer of Hebrews seeks to convey, at least in, in our understanding, a little bit of the, the word that, that God wants us to kind of look at and to consider. He says in verse number 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see what he says there again in verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly. Love that. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter addresses this same truth. 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes in verse number 11, he says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It entered unto you abundantly. What is this abundance? The Greek word that is used for this word that we, we see translated as abundance in this Context is a, is a word which, which helps us at least identify what Jesus was seeking to get across. And though those who were around him still didn't understand it, they were a little confused. The whole point that Jesus was saying here is that this word, and I give it more abundantly, that word abundantly is the idea of something that is so beyond. Matter of fact, the King James translators translated it differently throughout the, the New Testament. They didn't always translate it the exact same way. The Greek word paruso is the idea, or translated in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 1 as superfluous. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, it's translated exceedingly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 13, it's translated as highly. What is the point? The point is that God is giving to you and to me something that is absolutely beyond comprehension. It's so high. It's so exceeding. And yet how many Christians live the abundant life? Why do we get so bogged down? Why do we get so bothered by things in this world, in this life, that are so trivial and so trite? And we come to a place in the Christian life and we walk into the house of God or we walk into a, a, a store or whatever and we just...
And so for the next few months, years, <laughs> no, it won't take us years. We're going to be studying about the abundant life. And again, I told you earlier that we're going to be taking more of a topical understanding of the messages throughout the series and just dealing with different things that God desires us to be abundant in or to abound in. We'll see those. But let's let's look at this, this verse that Jesus gives to us. And let's, let's look at three different aspects regarding this verse. First of all, notice the context. Again, every time we study the Word of God, we've always got to keep things in context. Right? I mean, it would be one thing for, for me to offer to you and say, hey, listen, if you come to my office tomorrow, um, I am going to give you an abundance of, and just fill out the blank. Some of you say money. <laughs> Some of you might say, you know what, I don't want your money. You're getting my money anyway, right? Every time you tithe and offer, I'm getting some of that. But uh, you say, you know, I'm not interested in your money. I, I, I just want some knowledge. I want an abundance of, of wisdom. I need this, or, or whatever it might be, whatever that, that blank is. And, and, and I can say, okay, you know what, I, I can give you what, what God has given to me. I can open up the scriptures and, and share with you some things. But, but I can't give you an exceeding a high, a superfluous type of whatever it is that you're after. But God can. And I don't understand here what Jesus is saying. Now again, I want to take us to the end of this. Okay, we're going to come back to verse number 10. But to the end of this, notice again what Jesus, or what we are told about the Jews there. Verse 19, there was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. I mean, they're coming to the place where they're saying, we don't get this. <coughs> Matter of fact, we don't like what this guy's saying. Now, some were for him, some were against him. Right? Because in essence, what Jesus is talking about here is eternal life. I don't know what it is that, that he's offering to them, and they're saying, wait, you're, you're a man like we are. There's no possible way that you can offer eternal life. You're not God. You can't do this. And obviously, within the context here, Jesus is clarifying the fact that I am God, right? I mean, he uses the I am statements. I want us to understand the context. Verse number six. This parable... Spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. And then he said unto them again, okay, here we go. I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers or all the other people, the prophets, the priests, right? I mean, he's dealing with a lot of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees those who were scribes, those who were supposed to be lawyers of the, 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 the Torah, of the law of God, all that have come before me, thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. The sheep speaking of Israel. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved or delivered or rescued and shall go in and out and find pasture. And can I say to you, that's exactly what God desires of us who have been saved. He wants us to find pasture. <coughs> we ask you, do you come to the place and you feed and feast off of the pasture of God's word every day? Ooh, I just can't get enough. Oh man, this is so good. Oh, I, I, I just can't wait till devotion time. I can't wait till church time. I, I can't wait just dive into the Word of God. He wants you to, to do that. And I believe that perhaps one of the reasons why we struggle the way we do is because we're not feasting on the riches of His grace through His Word. And so it says in verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have so the context that Jesus is 
speaking of here is, is the, the, the difference between the shepherd and the sheep and the thief. He's pointing now that, that he is much different than the others that have come along. He is the one who, who has come along to, to offer something. Notice what he tells us about the difference here. Notice what the hireling does or the thief. Verse 10 again says, The thief comes not but for to steal. The thief comes to kill. The thief comes to destroy. Verse 12, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep. And he flees. And so the wolf catches them, and it scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling. And notice, he cares not for the sheep. You see, the reality that he's pointing out here is that the hireling or the thief takes up this business of shepherding for his own sake. What he gets out of it. He comes to the place where he scatters or flees. He doesn't care about the sheep. He's just in it for his own self. For his own goodness. But on the contrary. You have the good shepherd. <coughs> Jesus says in verse number 11. I am the good shepherd. Verse number 14. I am the good shepherd. The hireling who does what? He only cares about himself. But not the shepherd. The shepherd, on the other hand, is interested in the sheep and what is best for them. What is it that they need? They need life. Verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 17, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life. I might take it again. I mean, here's, here's Jesus. He's just pointing out. He's, he's saying, listen, I want you to understand. Here's what this shepherd does. He offers his life. He's willing to sacrifice for. Now, that's the context. So Jesus is coming to this place and he's saying, listen, I want you to understand the difference between the hirelings, the thieves, the false teachers, and all of them, and me. I want you to understand the difference. Everyone over here is in it for their own business, for their own sake, for their own self-pleasure, for their own self-will. I'm in it for the sheep. That's the context. Keep the context. Now notice, secondly, the content. So, if Jesus is speaking about the difference between the, the, the thief and the shepherd, what is he speaking of? What is the content? What is this all about? And so, in verse number 10, again, I am come that they might have life. Jesus is not just interested in his sheep having life, is he? He says, and that they might have it more abundantly. He's not just interested in them having life, but to have a superior life than what others have. Every single person in this world enjoys, or I should just say it this way, has life. There's something that you and I share in common with every single other person in this world. And that's life or that's breath. But Jesus is speaking beyond that. Say, I, I want you to know that I'm offering a life that is beyond. I'm offering you a life that is superfluous. I, I'm offering you a life that is 
superior. Oh, I want you to have it. And I wonder how many Christians live with that abundant life in mind. I mean, we're, we're, we're for the most part, we're, we're no different than the rest of the crowd. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm offering you. I'm offering you life that is abundant. What an incredible statement. The word that he uses here, again, as I said earlier, denotes that which is not absolutely essential to life. Right? I mean, if we talk about what are the essential things to life, what are the bare necessities, right? What are they? Well, you know, we need water, we need food, we need sleep, we need massages, right? And I mean, th those are the things that we need. And, and I know some of you are saying, did Laura ever get her massage last week? Kids, did you give it to no, just kidding. I failed. I'm so sorry. I, I kept it in the context of feet, okay? And I knew I had an escape route because she does not want her feet touched. And uh, I can't believe I'm preaching this. <laughs> Back to the context and the content here, right? And, and, and so, so he says, listen, I, I want you to understand that, that th this that I'm offering you is so more than the essentials to life. It's that which is super added. That's the word. Super added to make life exuberant and vibrant. Let me ask you, does that... Describe your life. I mean, when people look at you, when your neighbors see you, and the, 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 your, your classmates sit next to you, your co-workers are around you, do they just simply come to play and say, would you stop enjoying life, please? Man, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this. I mean, I don't want to see that anymore about you. I mean, we, we have a, a mission statement in the Norman family, and one of the, the part of the mission statement, we say this, that the Norman family exists to glorify God. Why? And we have two different statements, and one of those statements is enjoy life. I want to enjoy life. You know what? <clears throat> a lot of times, life gets stolen. I let little things, I love how the Proverbs remind us in so many different things, the foxes and all the things that come in and spoil things in our lives. And Christ says, listen, I came to offer you an abundance of life. And listen, he is not just speaking about eternal life <coughs> after you die. Now, do we have an amazing life awaiting us after we die? You better believe it. I mean, it starts off with going to heaven. Just remember, we're not always going to be in heaven. Right? Heaven isn't the peak. It's not the apex. It's what? It's just the beginning. Right? You sit here and say, oh, mansions. Oh, yeah, glorious. This is not going to stay the way it is. <laughs> right? I mean... Here's what we get to enjoy. The presence of God forever. Amen. It doesn't get any better than that. Amen. Do you know what? He doesn't want us to just think of that. He, he says, no, I want you to experience this kind of life, this vibrancy here and now, not <coughs> just hereafter. And so, he tells us, this is wonderful, this is glorious, I want to offer you an abundance of life. So, where does that leave us? It leaves us to the key word. Not only do we see the context, the content, but I want you to see the condition. Because in essence, this 
abundant life is conditional. We don't see it in our English text. Here, here's, here's how I've always read this verse. Here's how I've always understood this verse. And I'm sure that you're probably the same. I've always understood this verse to simply mean this. Isn't eternal life great? Isn't eternal life grand? Isn't eternal life glorious? I mean, isn't this, it is wonderful. I mean, when, when you get to heaven, when we all get to heaven, right? What a day of rejoicing that will be. And, and, you know, it's all going to be great. It's going to be, yes, that's true. But he says, listen, while we're here on earth, the rest of it go, right? I mean, yeah, I want you to rejoice. I want you to have, have joy. I want you to have life. I want you to have, have peace. I want you to have hope. This is what I want for your life. Then why is it we don't? Because it's conditional. This word, abundantly, is a word that is in what we call or what the Grammatical structure is in the subjunctive mood. You and I, we easily understand the indicative mood and the imperative mood, right? An indicative mood is simply this. It's a statement of fact, right? I mean, hey, the boy crossed the street. That's a statement of fact. That's a true statement, right? The boy, what did he do? He crossed the street. You and I can see evidence of that because he's on the other side. Jesus died for your sins. That is indicative. That is a statement of fact. It is absolutely true. It is imperative that you what? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right? You must be born again. That's imperative. The subjunctive mood, which isn't often used is the idea or the understanding of what we would say potential or possible. You see, what Jesus is speaking of here is that it is one thing for us to have life, it's another thing for us to have it abundantly. And therefore, we have to understand that this kind of life that Jesus is speaking of is potential or possible. Because the reality is when we start studying through the abundant life, you know what Jesus calls us to, demands us to? He says, I want you to abound. In love. I want you to abound in joy. I want you to abound in grace. I want you to abound in good works. Those are some of the things that we're going to be studying. The action is described in this verb as that which may or may not occur. It depends on your circumstance. What do you do? You see, you can choose to be sour. You can choose to become bitter. You can choose to be joyful. When Jesus says this to us, don't, don't get locked in and say, okay, here's, here's, here's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm offering you eternal life. No, that's what he's saying. I'm offering you a life, a life on this earth that is absolutely exceeding, superfluous, highly abundant, full of life, full of joy, full of peace, full of hope, full of good works, full of Full, full. That's what I offer you. Will we receive it? Oh, it's great for me to have eternal life when I die. Yep, it's wonderful. It's great. Can't wait for that. What about now? He wants us to be full of this. 
Christians on cloud nine all the time, even though they've just been told they've got cancer. Even though they've just been told they lost their job. Even though you've just been told your child was killed in an accident, you can have peace. You can have joy. Absolutely. Why? Because Christ says, that's what I give you. I want this abundant life. I want this kind of life. And so as we close this evening, <coughs> We think of this, again, listen, it, 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 it doesn't happen unless we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Christ, of course, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but through Him. He is the door. He is the shepherd. He offers to us life through his own self as he bore our sin on the cross. And this life that Jesus offers is absolutely incredible. <coughs> and if that's true, then does it show? Perhaps the reason it doesn't show is that it's not real. As I preached this morning, I just have religion. I don't have a religion. And so maybe you sit there and you think in your mind and your heart, and I'm not trying to cause you to doubt or to question your salvation. I'm just causing us to simply think is this what I have? Is this what I have? This is what he's offering. And he wants us to enjoy the benefits and the blessings of knowing him. I want you to, I want you to have it. The, beth, the blessings, the benefits, we're going to see. Joy, peace, <coughs> love, hope. Right? And there's so many things that, yeah, this is what I want. I want you to have a spirit-filled life. Yes! I want you to have it. However, there are steps that we can take in order to make that happen, and we'll see that in our study. But, understand it's not in your own strength and your own power. That's why the Holy Spirit is so precious to because he will empower and enable us to do that. And so as we look at this series, The Abundant Life, there's one simple statement, thought, I want to leave with you. Don't just seek to be alive. Don't just seek to be alive. I just want to be saved. I just want to go to heaven when I die. No. Don't just seek to be alive. Seek to thrive. That's what he offers us. A life that is abundant. There are things that he has called us to abound in. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. God, thank you for this incredible statement that Jesus makes. He has come not only offer and give us life, but to give us life that is more abundant. Oh God, I want this abundant life. I, I want my life to be full, to exceed, to overflow. Matters. So God, help me. God, to be fully surrendered to you. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice 
as the good shepherd. And he would lay his life down for the sheep. Oh God, what a blessing. Father, I pray that you'll help us more to recognize what Christ did on the cross for our sins. And God made it jolt us. God, we don't want to just seek to be aligned. We don't want to just survive. We want to thrive. And I pray that you'll help us to do so. So God, again, thank you for your work.